thought I'd just reasonable to start with just BCR in, in general um, and some uh, guidelines, recommendations. So I'll, I'll kind of try to breeze through this so we can get to the more QA stuff later. I don't have disclosures relevant to this. So as a surgeon, I know biochemical recurrence is a common problem despite meticulous technique, patient selection, et cetera, et cetera. And BCR has been associated with metastases, with cancer-specific mortality, and even in some cases with overall mortality. Um, not all biochemical recurrences are equal. Um, one has to consider things that have been shown over the years to be prognostic, such as PSA doubling time, and of course the grade of the original cancer, uh, whether there were positive surgical margins, et cetera. So, so it's important to kind of take a careful look at each individual patient. Like Dr. Davis said, some of these men do quite well if the re re recurrence is distant and the doubling time is slow, et cetera. Um, I'll just go back to one paper from my institution prior to my arrival at that institution, uh, but it, it is uh, rather historic. Um, about 2,000 men operated on by Patrick Walsh. Um, of course, back in the day, the majority were Gleason 6, um, a minority were Gleason 7 or higher, uh, although probably some of the 6s would be you know, upgraded in today's uh, uh, Gleason scoring system. Um, the metastasis-free survival was about 82% at 15 years. Again, you know, 15% developed biochemical recurrence, and a vast majority of those were the folks with the higher grade disease. Um, one third of the men develop metastases. So these are numbers that I just have in my brain when I talk to patients. Um, um, so 15% BCR, and of those 15%, one third went on to metastasize. So even, you know, it was not a death sentence necessarily back in the, back in the day. These metastases occurred at a median of eight years after the radical prostatectomy, and then the median survival was about five years from the development of the metastases. And so these are just easy to quote sort of milestones to tell patients uh, of high anxiety about their BCR in an era when there was not a whole lot to do other than ADT, for example, um, and some radiation therapy. And the predictors of probability uh, and time to development of metastases in this series were what we said, Gleason score, time to the recurrence, and PSA doubling time, as you can see the three curves. This has been known for a long time. Uh, and sort of set the stage for now the EAU years later, with a lot more data looking backwards, setting up BCR into two sort of risk categories. And I'll focus on the, the post-radical prostatectomy one on the, on the top there, um, which a low risk recurrence is considered a recurrence with the PSA doubling time of greater than one year and a gray group of less than four, i.e. Gleason 6, um, Gleason 7 disease at the radical prostatectomy. The high-risk BCRs are those with a shorter doubling time, a year or less, or the higher gray groups at radical prostatectomy. Relatively easy to just memorize that and use that in your clinical day-to-day, uh, -day. Um, and important to discuss that with patients. So what are the implications of this? A, a, a paper came out just quite recently uh, from Europe where they kind of use these definitions um, uh, at the EAU BCR uh, classification as a decision tool for salvage radiotherapy. And this was a big multicenter study. They have about 800 patients that were EAU low-risk BCR and about 1,500 that are having a EAU high-risk BCR. And for the low-risk recurrence patients, the 12-year overall survival was 87 versus 78 percent for early versus early salvage radiation versus no radiation and the cancer-specific survival was 100% versus 96%, whether they got early salvage or no salvage. So this really suggests, again, like, like John was saying earlier, you could consider surveillance for these folks with the low-risk BCR category. Um, again, you'd have to really look closely at each individual patient, but these numbers were not statistically significant whether they got salvage or not. Now, if you're in the higher-risk group, higher Gleason scores at RP, low doubling times, now you had a difference between overall survival, 81% versus 61% early salvage versus no salvage radiation, and cancer risk of survival, 98 versus 82% early versus uh, no salvage. Um, so these patients should be treated with radiotherapy uh, at a minimum. Um, and these are sort of the hazard ratios from that study. You can see that a high risk recurrence compared to the reference low risk recurrence was a 1.5 fold risk. Uh, um, of, uh, of adverse outcomes, and early 
salvage, late salvage, both actually had lower uh, risk ratios, although only the early was um, statistically significant. Um, so that just sort of supports the conclusions that I showed earlier. Um, this is something I just had one of my uh, students look at. Um, you know, we're seeing an increase in high-risk patients going to radical prostatectomy. This is very much not the, the Patrick Walsh era. Um, we're not operating, as you all know, very much on Gleason 6 at all. Um, and of course, that's leading to more difficult surgery, despite having better tools. And of course, biochemical recurrence rates are going up. So in the, in the left column, you can see radical prostatectomy by era. And it's basically, you know, 2000, 2004, that's a typo, 2005, 2009, 2010, 2014, 2015 to 2020. Um, and you can see that the gray groups are just, you know, going up. We were operating 31% 30, of men had anything higher than Gleason 6 back in the day, and now 73% of men do. And it went up, you know, again, by five-year block. And if you want to just scroll over to, uh, I don't know if I have a, do I have a pointer? Uh, but anyway, the five-year biochemical recurrence rates are the, uh, are the there we go, uh, are the, uh, um, uh, basically were 20% in the early 2000s, 25% between 05 and 2009, and then 31% in the last five-year block that we can analyze. So, I mean, we're really seeing a lot more BCR because we are operating on higher-risk patients, and we have to be attuned to all the different options that we can offer to them. And this is just likely to continue. Um, so, you know, how do I manage them? Well, obviously, after surgery, you track PSAs. Uh, there's intervals based on radical prostatectomy pathology. I will say somewhere between every three to 12 months, I'll get a PSA. I rarely will check PSAs uh, more, than, more frequently than yearly once they're out three years. But again, you know, extra high-risk patients, you can certainly check it every six months for a long time. There's a paper from our institution that said you can actually finally stop at 20 years, but not at 10, because we've all seen the patients who somewhere between year 10 and 12, and 12 to 15, and even 15 to 20, have a recurrence, sometimes a dramatic one. Um, and you can, of course, consider stopping checking PSAs if life expectancy is plummeting, the patient has you know, increasing comorbidities. Um, the definition of BCR, I would say, is uh, you know, obviously a PSA persistence would be you never got to zero, there was no nadir that was undetectable versus a true recurrence, which is what we're discussing here. And I think 0.2 or greater on two post prostatectomy tests is an acceptable uh, definition. I, I personally don't use a lot of super sensitive PSA testing, although that's a whole different discussion. Um, and, uh, 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 and then I, I would suggest risk stratifying the patient per the EAU system that we discussed that quite easy low risk versus high risk BCR uh, stratification. Um, the next steps would be imaging, and there will be more talks about that. Obviously, that's the whole theme here. Um, CT and bone scan were the conventional ones, somewhat outdated, but certainly can identify, you know, adenopathy uh, and, 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 and uh, very sensitive for bone lesions. Um, and in the modern era, uh, there's PSMA PET, which is pretty much what we use exclusively if that can get reimbursed. Um, there's also MRI of the pelvis. Often they've had that, you know, preoperatively. One could get it postoperatively, look for changes. Um, the PET sensitivity is about 75%. Specificity quite high, not 100%, but high per, on a per lesion basis. Uh, and that, again, depends on the windows and the quality of the person reading it. Um, and the advantage here, of course, with the PET is it's whole body, um, and it's much more sensitive and specific than just bone scan for bony lesions. Um, and pelvic MRI, on the other hand, sensitivity somewhere on the 40%, specificity maybe 80% for pelvic nodal METs by size criteria, and this is on meta-analysis. And it's rather good for detecting recurrence at the anastomosis, um, and it's helpful in the biochemical recurrence state after radiation therapy to look at what the prostate itself looks like, uh, where the seeds were placed, and that, that sort of stuff. Um, we tend to image at PSAs of 0.3 or greater. Um, I've heard oncologists advocate waiting to 0.5 or greater at my institution, um, but of course that could delay treatment if you think someone is in the high-risk group and you're anxious to get them towards RT, RT, ADT, et cetera. Um, and I think this is also very controversial. I think some people think it, you know, the earlier you get the, the recurrence treated, the better. But, but I, I think you just get this problem, which is, again, this is an older study, uh, early days of the gallium, but, you know, at very low PSAs, 
your pet positivity is going to be lower, uh, probably because you just don't see where the problem lies. And as you get to PSAs of, say, over 0.5, you get into, you know, 60% plus uh, positivity, you can identify the recurrence. Um, Imaging by just conventional PET for recurrence was, as you can see, the numbers, you know, sort of middling numbers. Imaging by PYL PET, which is the agent we tend to use at Hopkins, is um, from the Osprey study was about, uh, again, for high recurrence, high, high risk biochemical recurrence states, 58% of the time was positive when conventional imaging was negative. Um, and the positive predictive value of this PYL agent was about 82%. When you imaged high-risk patients, PSAs at this point were, were in the single digits uh, for most of them. Um, imaging by the gallium PET, uh, sort of a 75% detection rate overall in high-risk biochemical recurrence cases after prostatectomy. Uh, in this study, some had already gotten some salvage radiation as well, and uh, the imaging was used to look for METs in the, in the recurrent state. And there, the positive predictive value kind of imaged, um, mirrored the PYL and it was about 84%. Um, and PSA levels were associated with detection, but they did not find that PSA doubling time or nadir was associated with positivity. Um, the, the impact of, of a post-operative PET scan, and we're going to, again, other speakers will talk, but, you know, one is it allows for obviously tailored salvage radiation, prostate bed only versus prostate bed plus pelvic nodal, and I think the results... Um, uh, definitely can change management, uh, certainly changed management intent in 62% of patients in a, uh, a study done by Dr. Roach from, from UCSF. Um, I think a PET result will allow for metastasis-directed therapy, um, and I think, again, speakers will go into that, so I'll kind of cruise through that, but it certainly have been some big studies like Orioles and Stomp, and pooled analyses from these showed that median progressive free survival was prolonged with the administration of metastasis-directed therapy compared to observation in the biochemical return state with a positive scan. Um, and the largest benefit was men, in men with a high-risk somatic mutation in the tumor. Um, so overall, I'll, I'll wrap up. Uh, if, I, if I get a negative metastatic workup, I think observation is reasonable for the EAU low-risk patients, patients with negative surgical margins. Um, I think in the high-risk patients, certainly RT alone uh, is reasonable and was supported by uh, uh, various trials. RT plus ADT is certainly reasonable as well for the high-risk patients. Um, and then there's a whole some second-line data with the Embark study that you could use enzalutamide or enzalutamide plus ADT, which are now both FDA-approved for high-risk biochemical recurrences after prostatectomy plus or minus salvage radiation. Uh, ADT alone is not what we're doing nowadays. That was maybe back in 2000. Um, um, of course, a positive workup Right away, I refer to uh, experts uh, that deal with that, and we'll be going into um, RT plus MDT, RT plus ADT, um, ADT plus chemo, ADT alone. Again, the whole spectrum of, of, of options comes up, which, which uh, we will be discussing later here. Um, to conclude my part here, again, I would just confirm that this is a BCR, repeat your PSA, determine if this is a low risk or high risk one. If you need more time, get to a doubling time. Um, image with a PET somewhere at 0.3 to 0.5, don't wait too long. Um, and if PET's negative or positive only in the pelvis, you know, I think one can, by risk stratification, go with surveillance, radiation, radiation plus ADT with second line alternative with some uh, hormonal agents. And if the PET's positive for disease outside the pelvis, obviously uh, get your oncologist involved, uh, get a rad onc multidisciplinary team to administer or consider administering uh, multifocal, multimodal therapy. Thank you.